Boris Johnson is elected as the leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party. More than three years after the EU referendum, Boris Johnson promises to deliver Brexit within 100 days. Do or die. We are going to energise the country. We're going to get Brexit done. This is yes. not about telling people to cheer up. No. This couldn't be more serious. With Parliament bitterly divided... If you are a Ramona, you do everything you can to stop us leaving the European Union. I mean, I wouldn't believe the stuff that's coming from Number 10. This is a Prime Minister prepared to do almost anything to keep his promise. 14 cabinet seconds. 15, how plus to his mains. Any trust in the Prime Minister was lost at that point. Bonjour. I'm the BBC's political editor, and I've been behind the scenes as MPs fight to determine the future of our country. Idiot members of Parliament have managed to really mess this up. With unique access to those in power. Where's this going to end? You tell me. You tell me. This is the story of how Boris Johnson's vow to get Brexit done pushes our democracy to breaking point. The decision was unlawful. Someone just texted me saying we have officially imploded as a nation. And ends in one of the greatest political gambles of all time. They have to agree to a general election on December the 12th. He said that the whole point is it gets bumpier and bumpier and the mud is flying everywhere. Just hold on to the handlebars and we'll get through. Boris Johnson's at Buckingham Palace talking to the Queen and a little while we'll see him come up here as Prime Minister for the first time and then he will stand at the podium which I've just found out is double reinforced so in case he bashes it it doesn't fall over he'll tell us in theory what he's going to try and do. Brexit is the thing the Tory party thinks they have to do to survive. Boris Johnson was Mr Brexit, and enough of them believe he's the only person that can do it for them. But he's inheriting a problem that Whitehall and Brussels has failed to solve for three years. We're going to fulfil the repeated promises of Parliament to the people and come out of the EU on October the 31st. No ifs or buts. Tories out! Tories out! We in this government will work flat out to give this country the leadership it deserves. And that work begins now. Thank you very much. This is the start of a new and very different era. Boris Johnson and the Brexiteers are now in charge. But maybe they're not so much taking back control and inheriting a precarious and fragile position. We know that Boris Johnson really wants to get a different deal with the EU, number one. But we know that if he can't get a different deal with the EU, he'll leave without a deal. Some of the cabinet, people like David Gawk, think that would be a kamikaze, crazy thing for a Conservative government to do, and they don't want to be part of it. We are going to energise the country. We're going to get Brexit done. Right, what do you think of this? I'll tweet this. Congratulations, Boris Johnson, on being elected as leader of Conservatives and PM, looking forward to returning to the backbenches. That works. Fine, I think I'll tweet that. Boris said to me, look, I'm not some kind of no-deal fanatic. I want a deal. I pressed him a bit on how he's going to do that. I think it'd be fair to say I didn't get detailed answers. As of today, I don't see what the plan is. If there is a plan that's been articulated, I think it's one that's, that's dangerous. Um, that's why I've just confirmed the fact that I'll stand down from government. And then if I put a sort of second tweet, it's important to point new cabinet that unites and not divides the Conservative Party and delivers an orderly exit from the EU dash with a deal. Or is that a bit snarky if it's on a... I want to wait till he's finished speaking. Yeah. Yes, don't, don't press the tweet button now. <laughs> yeah. The biggest decision for any Prime Minister, really, at the start, is who to put in their cabinet. And for Boris Johnson, that will tell us a lot. Hello, you all right? Good, all right, thank you. Do you think we're going to have any names for six? 
Okay. All right, fine. Well, if you, as, as and when you hear anything, if you're able, then any steer would be good. All reshuffle stuff in the live off the back. So that we haven't got any picture, so it's not in the piece because it's changing so fast. Okay, yeah, just so you know. She uses 14 per minute. 15 out plus Theresa May. So 15 out, Javid's gone into Downing Street. Yes. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, is at Westminster for us tonight. Well, we know, George, that he wants to do things very, very differently indeed, not least because in the last hour or so, he has lost 15 cabinet ministers from Theresa May's team. So I think we can be completely clear he wants to send a message. This is a new government. Thank you. 15. 16 now. Mel Stry is 16. Well, I mean, why don't you know if you're going to do it? I mean, also, everyone says they've been a bloody awful cabinet. More than half have gone, by far the biggest to be around here. Elsewhere on Mr Johnson's team, he's expected to appoint the campaign director of Vote Leave, Dominic Cummings, as a senior advisor. Vote Leave were found to have broken electoral law, and so for some people, Dominic Cummings is a real hate figure. I'm told that during the Johnson campaign, some MPs asked if he planned to bring Dominic Cummings in, and he denied it. Well, good morning, everybody. We are now committed, all of us, to leaving the European Union on October the 31st, or indeed earlier. If it had been your dream all your life to do one thing, to win one prize, and then finally you get your hands on it, I mean, that's got to feel pretty massive, right? What are you doing, Mr Johnson? Boris Johnson is a deeply, 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 deeply ambitious person. Can you get a Brexit deal, Mr Johnson? One of his friends in Cabinet told me that he's convinced he's actually a political psychopath. He'll just do anything to achieve the best outcome for him at that political moment. Our friends and partners on the other side of the channel are showing a little bit of reluctance at the moment to change their position. That's fine, I'm confident that they will. But in the meantime, we have to get ready for, for a no-deal outcome. I'm, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you because there's breaking news. The government is expected to suspend Parliament for a number of weeks from the middle of next month. I think that's actually come from Laura Koonsberg. It was much better to get a call from a source last night than to hear someone else break it. <laughs> All right, talk later on. Cheers, thanks. Bye. Bye. Uh, so late last night, I had a call from a senior figure in Westminster telling me that privy councillors were soon going to be on the way to go and see the Queen to say that Boris Johnson planned to prorogue Parliament. And I spent quite a long time last night and a lot of time early this morning with hardly any phone signal because I was still on holiday uh, trying to verify that that was actually true. And it is. So here we go. This is incredible. It is incredible. It's the political theatrics of it. No, I mean, it's so, it's, you know, it's so deliberately productive. provocative. <gasps> it is an absolute disgrace and it is completely unconstitutional. MPs aren't even back yet but already it's just lit the match on this big stick of dynamite that's been waiting to blow up for, well, since before he moved into number 10. I wouldn't be at all surprised if he wouldn't really want Parliament to be closed down for as long as he possibly could close it down. These are autocratic instincts, and we have to fight them. This is a new government. We're not going to wait until... October the 31st before getting on with our plans to take this country forward. And there will be ample time in Parliament for MPs to debate uh, the EU, to debate Brexit and uh, all the other issues. Ample time. Any Prime Minister, especially a new one, is absolutely entitled to pause Parliament for a while to come back with their new programme. But it is politically outrageous in the context of the timing and the political moment that we're in. Are you trying to avoid scrutiny of Parliament? Certainly not, no. Are you worried about a legal challenge? This is a completely proper constitutional procedure. 
for them it's about survival. They're using brutal tactics because it's a brutal battle for their survival. You know, in number 10, what they believe is that if they don't stick to the Brexit deadline, if this doesn't happen, then they're toast and it's finished and it's over. So they'll do anything to try to stop that happening. Hi, Annie, how are you? Well, <laughs> fine, tell us everything. Well, how long have you got? <laughs> Three and a half, fine. It's now over to the new rebel alliance on the former Remain side to see if they can be organised enough, if they can be determined enough to change the law to make it impossible for Boris Johnson to take us out of the European Union without a deal. Thanks. Cheers, guys. Bye. Well, the new rebel alliance are something we've never really seen before because it's not just broadly a coalition of people who are from different parties on the left or different parties on the right. This is like so far on the left and so far on the right, they almost come round to meet each other. Who's coming up, Laurie? I'm coming up. Yeah, you're just all right. Where's this going to end? You tell me. You tell me. I've been mapping out all the different scenarios. Anything can happen. How many scenarios have you got? About a dozen. Twelve. <laughs> <laughs> Only twelve. Yeah, yeah. What's the craziest one? Uh, having a week off. <laughs> <laughs> The last 24 hours have revealed the true character of Boris Johnson and I think, as importantly, the real nature of his politics. Dealing with Boris Johnson is like dealing with someone in their terrible twos. They want something. You know it's not good for the family. That They'll throw a tantrum and they start kicking and screaming on the floor. And so you have to be the adult to control the situation, otherwise it gets out of hand and we're all damaged. I mean, I wouldn't believe the stuff that's coming from Number 10, that, you know, well, they've made progress and the EU have changed their position. It just isn't true. If Parliament is going to act, it's going to, going to have to act next week. You know, where I am is I will support that. If we fail, we will depart on the 31st of October without a deal. The whole plan for the Rebel Alliance who are trying to block no deal is to grab control of the House of Commons, to change the law. So Boris Johnson will be forced to ask the EU for an extension in order to stop him trying to take us out of the EU without a deal. We've been working with the opposition party leaders and we've got a bill, a very, very straightforward, intended simply to require the Prime Minister to seek an extension if he hasn't got a deal through by the 19th of October. If they can't stick together to get the numbers through Parliament, well, then they lose by the oldest rule in the book. Yeah, hi. Hi, it's Gitto. So just, just, just to clarify then, at this point in time, I think we, we have got the numbers, but you can appreciate the, the stronger um, the support is today, uh, I think the more effective we will be. And obviously, um, we would be delighted if you were able to support. This time last week, uh, there was no agreement amongst those colleagues who wants to stop a no-deal Brexit as to how and when we should be moving. Now, what changed the narrative was the decision to prorogue Parliament. I think any sense of trust in the Prime Minister uh, to be true to his word was lost at that point. There is a momentous day ahead in Westminster as Tory rebels join forces with opposition MPs to try to block a no-deal Brexit on the 31st of October. Right, colleagues, order, order. Thank you very much indeed for coming to this uh, European Research Group meeting. Obviously, today is a really, really important day. Steve Bacon, he's the chairman of the ERG, who's the Tory group of backbenchers who are totally committed to Brexit. He reckons that the Rebel Alliance is appalling. He thinks the only thing they're really interested in is trying to stop Brexit happening at all. I feel extremely anxious for the future of our country. Idiot members of parliament, sometimes cowards, have managed to really mess this up. I've tried to avoid the T word for a long time, but really it is an act of treachery. Maybe not surprisingly, some MPs have just, frankly, had enough of all of their colleagues. You've had people from the very beginning who haven't been honest about their agendas on both sides of the debate. The ERG wanted chaos, which would then lead to us crashing out on a no-deal basis. And then you've had Remainers who said, I respect the result. 
The truth is they never respected the result and they've used every set of weasel words you could possibly form to get out of actually voting to deliver what the people told us to do. MPs are not voting tonight on whether to delay Brexit. They are voting to give themselves the right in the next couple of days to change the law, to block the Prime Minister from ever taking us out of the European Union without a formal arrangement in place. It would destroy any chance of negotiation for a new deal. It would destroy it. There is only one way, Mr Speaker, to describe this deal. It is Jeremy Corbyn's surrender bill. That's what it is. The result of the vote is coming very, very shortly. Ten seconds. If the eyes have it, that will mean that the rebels and the opposition parties have defeated the government. Duh. The eyes to the right, 328. The nose to the left, 301. Not a good start, Morris. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Thank you. Christ. I welcome tonight's vote. There is no consent in this House to leave the European Union without a deal. Do you want a beer? I, yeah, I, um, yes, let's have a beer. I think we need a beer and deserve one. Yeah, I do. Me too. It's terrible. What they've done is overturn the principle that uh, the government controls the business of the House of Commons. It is a constitutional outrage. For the Rebel Alliance to grab control of the House of Commons is totally against precedent, totally breaking the rules. So the people who've been most outraged about Boris Johnson breaking the rules have got pretty good at breaking the rules themselves. 21 Conservative MPs voted against the government, which led to a late-night round of phone calls from Downing Street expelling them from the party. In recent times, nothing like this has ever happened. You know, backbenchers are allowed to vote against the government. They're often bullied and cajoled and pushed not to do it. They're allowed to do it. Not under this administration. The first time I've ever voted against my own party in Parliament in 14 years, um, which is a, you know, a difficult thing to do, and I'm told that the consequence of that is uh, I'm going to lose the whip, and uh, that's uh, you know, obviously not something that's good. You know, I'm proud to be a Conservative MP, and I think any minute now I'll just stop being a Conservative MP. If our viewers have thought the last few years we've seen raucous, edgy, brutal debate down here at Westminster, in the last couple of days things seem to be getting worse before they can get better at some point. We're at the end of a, a long, long, painful stretch where there hasn't been a government with a convincing majority. Lots of the madness of this moment is a symptom of that. So sooner or later there's going to have to be an election. Boris Johnson is dealt a major blow as his own brother quits as a government minister and Conservative MP, saying he's torn between family and the national interest. Thank you. There's, there's Laura. Yeah. Right. Um, Prime Minister, can we just Thank have you. a quick chat and then you can t talk yeah, to lots of course, people? Yeah, your, yeah. your brother has quit his job this afternoon, expressing concern you're not acting in the national interest. Don't you get Hello, you yes, How are you? Nice what? to see you. Sorry. It's been a terrible few days for Boris Johnson. Let me take a picture of you. You know, his brother quit. He's lost his first big boat because of his own missteps of chucking people out in his party. And he doesn't quite know what to do. Nice to see you. You're playing games. Well, what I think You're people want us games. to do is to leave the European Union on well, October 31st. We all 31st. know that. Well, that's fantastic. We all that's know what we're going to do. But you're not done any... When you should be in Brussels negotiating, where is the negotiation going on? Well, 
Where is it? You're no. in Morley, in Leeds. You should be in Brussels. How will you bring this country together? The only when way to do that. Throwing people out of no. your party. The only way to do it is to get Brexit done on October the 31st and take the country forward. So, so can I just ask people here? Do you think we should get out on October the 31st? That's exactly what a general election will feel like if we get there. Boris Johnson will try to unite leavers against everybody else. That's a heck of a gamble. Yeah, on October the 31st, we will. We will. Boris. We will. My Thank son looks you. remarkably like you. I'd just like nice you to see you. Come on. look. Oh, well, nice to see you. Looks like you're, it could be your love child. Off my chest now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I hope you'll stick with us, everybody. Nice to see you. It's the Labour Party conference here, I so know, you're going to yeah. see lots and lots of people here. I was hoping to see Jeremy, but I didn't see him. Oh, Jeremy's around somewhere, but I'm not sure where he is just and at the I moment. I think he would love to you meet me. me. Would he? <laughs> go Boris, go Boris! <laughs> I don't think he'd want to hear that. In the coming general election, Labour will be the only party ready to put our trust in the people to have the final say on Brexit. With a choice, a credible leave, alongside Remain. The leader, Jeremy Corbyn, does not want to commit Labour to leaving the European Union or campaigning to stay in until after the general election, if it happens. Now, that position, frankly, is driving some Labour MPs and members crazy. We must make sure that Labour campaigns remain, and not just that, that we leave the campaign to remain. I think Jeremy is trying to find a compromise, but if he goes into that election saying, I don't have a view on the single biggest decision that we have to make, I think that my, what worries me is that every single interview he does will all be about Brexit. Do you think that Labour could win a general election with this position? Well, I think it makes it more difficult, and that's why I'm really pushing this, because I want Jeremy in number 10. The problem that Jeremy Corbyn has on Brexit is that many, many, many Labour voters voted Leave and lots of Labour MPs would find it really hard on the doorstep to say, oh, actually, I'm campaigning to remain. But the reality is, Tories are going full-throated for the Leave vote. If Labour tries to straddle both, they might just fall in between the, the gap. The UK's highest court will deliver an historic ruling this morning on Boris Johnson's decision to suspend Parliament. If the judgment goes against him, MPs could be recalled immediately. Mr Johnson will be thousands of miles away when the court delivers its vote. He's at the UN Climate yeah. Summit in New York. Here's our legal correspondent. Don Kashan has just tweeted, the Chief Usher has just brought water into this courtroom, joking. Champagne, anyone? <laughs> anyone? So we're waiting for the judgment of the Supreme Court which is about to rule on whether or not Boris Johnson lied to the Queen. <gasps> here we go, here we go, here we go. This prolonged suspension of parliamentary democracy took place in quite exceptional circumstances. She's got a giant spider on her dress. The courts in this country have, like, an allergy to politics, <laughs> right? Brings them out in hives. They don't do it, they don't want to get involved. So this is a huge history-making moment. The effect on the fundamentals of our democracy was extreme. No justification for taking action with such an extreme effect has been put before the court. The court is bound to conclude, therefore, that the decision to advise Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament was unlawful. Absolutely amazing. So it's basically... So it was unlawful, never so it never happened. It's like it didn't happen. <laughs> Someone just texted me saying we have officially imploded as a nation. <sighs> wow, 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 wow! This is about as bad as it could have been for the Prime Minister, short of actually saying that he's Pinocchio and has got the longest nose in the world. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, hi. Um, so at number 10, we're trying to sort out a response for before we hear from Johnson. The scope of the judgment is so serious that trying to just kind of brazen that out, it's like, really? So if any, for anybody with doubts about him, 
It's so bad. I will do talk to you We're waiting to hear from the Prime Minister, who's in New York, but I'm just going to leave you with this on the Evening Standard. The headline is, get your butt back here now. Uh, it's incredibly serious. I mean, I think the, the man should resign. They wanted to essentially gag Parliament so it could prevent Parliament doing its job. Parliament, you know, covered in scaffolding and torrential rain, the heavens opening. I think it is a metaphor for a lot of things. So we have opposition MPs that block and delay everything, running to the courts to block and delay even more. And I think the people outside this house understand what is happening. It's pretty extraordinary to have this kind of situation where a Prime Minister is found to have broken the law and then doesn't have to resign, doesn't have to apologise, could even be able to turn this to his advantages for a certain group of voters. That's pretty bonkers. While we want to take our country up a gear, they are throwing on the handbrake. Well, Mr Speaker, we will not betray the people who sent us here. It's that kind of visceral populist argument. I'm the only person who cares about honouring the promise from 2016, and everybody else in the establishment is trying to stop me doing it. The leader of the House, who I have to say, with his body language throughout this evening, has been so contemptuous. It's not all, let's find consensus, let's find a middle ground. It's let's stir up people on our side. It's very risky to behave like that. With many of us in this place subject to death threats and abuse every single day. And let me tell the Prime Minister that they often quote his words, surrender act, betrayal, traitor. I have to say, Mr Speaker, I've never heard such humbug in all my life. Order. 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 Good morning. Hello, good morning. How are you? Very well, thank you. How are you? Good, I'm all right, thank you. Good. Am I allowed to sit on your sofa? You can sit wherever you like. You can lounge on the sofa if you want. <laughs> well, lounging around is normally what you always get criticised yeah, for in the I House know. of Commons. Why do you do that? Oh, purely comfort. Well, in these comfortable times? In these comfortable times. <laughs> do you worry about the terms of debate now? People are so dug into their own trenches that the idea of them ever being able to find common purpose sometimes feels quite far-fetched. If you are a uh, Ramona, you do everything you can to stop us leaving the European Union. Once we've left, then I think the country begins to come together. Shouting is always at its loudest just before the end of the test match. You are a senior member of the government and you're sitting there today even calling people on the other side of the argument Ramoners and I know you're somebody who believes in civility and manners. Aren't you worried about the terms people are chucking at each other? Well, that's what you do in politics, by phrasing your political argument in a way that you hope will be noticed by voters. They're so sensitive they can't cope with that, they really shouldn't be in politics. I think it's fundamentally shameful that we have a leading Conservative politician using such disparaging language. The Prime Minister said that he wanted to bring the country together, and yet the actions and the words of this administration is hell-bent upon uh, making those splits deeper and more bitter. I mean, loads of people in the Tory party, ministers in the Cabinet, are really worried about how this is going to play out. They're worried. And really desperate for him to get a deal now. Boris Johnson has said over and over again that UK is going to leave by the deadline, whatever happens. I think there's a deal to be done, and uh, Boris Johnson, I think, used the language cautiously optimistic, but of course we need the EU side to move as well. And he's been... Well, I do, I do. Go after you. Thank you very much. Parliament's made it a lot harder for him to leave on the 31st of October. So the key to getting out of the box that he's painted himself into is to get a deal. Of course, the sticking point is still is the Irish border. And, you know, I suppose the hope from some people is that Boris Johnson, through force of personality, can change the politics of it. Are you confident of getting a deal, Mr Juncker? 
It looks like a wonderful restaurant. I don't think I ever came here. <laughs> the president of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, he's the guy often who makes the difference. If he and Juncker can look each other in the eye over lunch, where they're apparently going to have snails and cheese, which sounds like a really bad idea, and say, let's do this, then maybe that will make a political difference. Can we have another chicken? You might have some Put a table, <laughs> and then happen to be sitting next door. If it goes badly, there's only a few weeks to go. That's not a good sign. See you later. Bye. I just was said that meeting didn't go well. No, apparently not. But it's all an expectation game, isn't it? You always get that problem with Gabriel. It sounds like they went through all the Northern Ireland stuff and then sort of went, oh, yeah, well, it's all very difficult, isn't it? Oh, right, so there's nothing, nothing to report? Well, not saying nothing to report, but it sounds like it was not a very good meeting. We'll get them to say that. Hello. I'm very well. How are you? Good, good, good. How was your lunch? Very good. Amazing. No snails. No snails? No snails. No, absolutely not. No snails. It was entirely... I don't know where the snails thing came from. Okay. This is so cool. Yeah. It's very, very, very beautiful. Yes, I won't lean in too much. But did you feel it was a meeting of minds just before we started? I know. Feel he was on your side. I've known John Paul Duncan for years and years. I used to know him 25 years and 30 years ago. Um, Do you feel he's on your side? Uh, okay. Everybody happy? Yeah. Um, you've just been with Jean Claude Juncker. In the last few minutes, the Commission has put a statement out saying after your lunch that they still are yet to see proposals they think are viable and workable. So it doesn't feel like this is going anywhere at the moment. I think the a deal is there to be done. Uh, there's a, perhaps a, a, an even greater willingness on the part of the Commission to engage than I had, than I had thought. So, so yes, I'm cautiously optimistic. It sounds like there are still very big gaps. Cheers. Let's check. The original agreement that Theresa May made was that if you couldn't find a solution to the Irish border, there was this guarantee called the backstop, where basically the UK keeps following the rules and regulations of the EU. Boris Johnson is trying to kind of hack bits of it off, and the EU is still saying, well, we still haven't seen concrete workable proposals. Michel Barnier, he's the EU's chief negotiator, has been one of the central characters in this whole saga. Bonjour. Good morning, Mr. Barnier. Good morning. Good morning. It's great. It's great. Happy <coughs> to see you. Happy to see you. The EU will remain calm, vigilant, respectful, respectful, and constructive. And one of the things that Michel Barnier has done throughout is brief MEPs, people like Philip Lumberts, the Brexit steering group, as they're known in Brussels. So every step of the way, MEPs have a better idea of what's really going on in the negotiations than British MPs. They want to take the United Kingdom out of single market, out of customs union, and they want the European Union to keep a 500 kilometer border open, allowing us basically to destroy the single market by sm smuggling in goods and services that would have been produced without respecting uh, the EU legislation. That's what they want us to do. And do they believe that we would ever accept this? So claiming that this strategy can deliver an agreement is, well, not taking the Europeans for idiots, it's basically taking the British people for idiots. Because he believes that they will buy his bullshit. I mean, it's one of the things we've seen again, is the two sides, they just slide past each other. It's like, oh, I almost understand where you come from. Oh, but I just don't. It's like ice skates, you know? And maybe what you need to happen is a big ice hockey crash where everything goes terribly wrong and then afterwards everybody can pick themselves up and walk on and, you know, dust off the bruises and then get on with life. Let's get Brexit done. We can, we must and we will, even though things have not been made easier by the surrender bill. We will work, we will work for a deal with our EU friends. But whatever happens, we must come out by the end of October.
Thank you very much. It's clear to me, number 10's goal, beyond anything else, is sticking to the Halloween deadline. In order to find something that can get through Parliament, Boris Johnson needs to persuade the EU to move a bit. You really believe that you could win the EU round? You really oh, do, believe yes. that? I absolutely do, yes. And I urge you, Laura, to keep hope alive and not to... Not Prime Minister, this is not about people feeling hopeful. This is about whether or not the government can come up with a deal with the European Union to protect the economy, to protect people's jobs and livelihoods. This yes. is not about telling people to cheer up. No. This couldn't be more serious. The number of people who really know exactly what is going on is obviously really small. Excuse me, please. So everybody is right now trading in hypotheticals. It's a pleasure to see so many. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for waiting um, for a little, well, a little while uh, while we've got ourselves together. Um, uh, it's pretty packed schedule, and you know all of these people here, all press here. I don't think any of them is just So I'm um, <laughs> The mood is very positive. I'm not involved directly with the negotiations, but everything I hear from those who are is very positive. Things seem to be moving. Very briefly. Yes. Worst, in the worst case scenario, yeah. is the Prime Minister not obliged to ask for an extension? <laughs> well, we'll have to wait and see. Well, it's not so much a tightrope for Boris Johnson, it's this sort of really awkward triangle that he's got to try to hold together with right, one of the sides collapsing. So he's got finding something that the EU can dollop a whole load of fudge on top of and stays within their parameters. So what is going to happen, I believe, is that they're going to try to conduct surgery on this withdrawal agreement, despite the Prime Minister telling me it was dead. That is why I am categorically committing to saying I will vote against a Brexit in name only deal, and I will. He's got to find something that sounds for his Brexiteers like it is proper Brexit, so that people Steve, like Steve Baker aren't going to think it's a total sellout. I'm in frequent text message contact with the Prime Minister, which is a very considerable privilege, which is a working class kid from Cornwall I never thought I'd be able to say. But if you don't do this right, we'll vote against it, and consequences will follow. It's not a threat, it's just they've got to do it right or there'll be a problem. Nigel, can I just, Nigel, can I just stop you very, very quickly? Hello, how are you? I'm fine, you okay? He also has to try to please the DUP, the Northern Irish Unionist Friends of the Conservatives. Now, they'll only sign up to something if it doesn't tear at the fabric of the union. Can I just ask you about where things are, do you think, with the talks? So you were in with Mr Johnson yesterday. Yes. And some Tory MPs are suggesting, actually, he's going to abandon the DUP. Uh, well, yeah, look, I've heard a lot of that stuff. He may abandon some Tory MPs before he abandons us. Do you trust Boris Johnson as much as you trusted Theresa May? I, I, look, I, 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 trust, I trust our own judgment, but I have to say, Boris uh, set out very, very sound principles in the backstop. At the end of this process, Boris Johnson's either going to be, you know, Houdini or Tommy Cooper, right? Because it's not impossible that the white smoke will go up and there'll be a text agreed and then we'll all trip off to Brussels tomorrow and the leaders will talk long into the night and they'll enjoy their petit four and their foie gras, whatever else they have, and they'll come back with a deal. It's possible. And if it doesn't work, then he might crash and burn in the most inglorious way. <laughs> So this is summit number 14 since Brexit. So what we yeah. proposed today, I think, because this story has got some complexity in it, is we just are pretty straight. Here's Johnson arriving, his first summit, massive moment. Uh, we'll probably hear from the DUP later through the day, but at what point, I just don't know. Yeah. Bye, right, love. Bye, bye. Well, there's been a deal. <laughs> There's been a deal. I've just got a te two line text saying deal done. It's a massive moment. I mean, it just shows you this process has always been like this. You've been going round, 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 and round, and round, and round. And then suddenly, you know, something changes. Prime Minister, BBC, BBC, what do you think? 
I'm so happy that you are able to have a deal. And to start the meeting here with knowing that for the moment we are able to agree is something which is not that common when I come to Brussels. They've done things that the EU and lots of people in Westminster told them they could never do. They've got a deal that looks different. So when it comes, I don't know if you'll have punched the Downing Street ceiling, right? But it's a big deal, it's a big deal. Compliments to Michel Barnier, but also uh, the UK negotiating team. This is really great stuff. The backstop is gone. I mean, it sounds like a boring policy thing, but the backstop was the titanic thing that stopped dozens and dozens of MPs in Westminster voting for this deal. And they've replaced it. And no question, Boris Johnson had to compromise too. Obviously, up until uh, Sunday, the British government was all good intentions, but uh, no substance. And on Monday and Tuesday, it was the point at which uh, Prime Minister Johnson started uh, backtracking. We dressed up the Northern Irish backstop. That's what we did. Well, no, you, you, did, you went back to our border down the Irish Sea. Exactly. But that was the Northern Irish only backstop, where right. basically you do the checks there. There, either you have the Northern Irish only backstop or you had the, the Pan UK backstop, but there's no other choice in town. He's done a deal with the EU that does the thing that he promised the DUP that it wouldn't do. It puts a customs border in the Irish Sea. Well, look, we're disappointed, obviously, that the Prime Minister has taken the action that he did. He decided to, I think, concede too much. Uh, under pressure, and uh, as a result, we've ended up in this unfortunate situation. And Boris Johnson seems to have decided there's not that much point now of trying to please the DUP anymore. You can't let the tail wag the dog. He needs the votes, but he needed a deal, and he needed a moment, and he needed a moment to force Parliament, force people in Parliament to pick a side. Hello. Hello. You're right. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, these are live cameras, just to let you know. Oh, oh, very funny. No, they are. No, they are, no, but they are live cameras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I thought, you, I thought you were someone who understood technology. Switch it off and walk past it. Get out. Yeah, they are live. <laughs> Hello, hi. How are you? That's quite all right. Hi, how, how are you? I'm okay. How much sleep have you had? I don't know. I didn't think it was good. We were hard as nails, you are. Hard as nails. Hard as nails. Did you celebrate on the plane on the way home? Uh, well, I think it's not. I think any celebrations would be premature at this stage. Right, is everybody ready? Um, do you accept that you have broken a promise you made to the DUP no, for the that bigger at all. prize of the deal? No. That's what they feel. Well, I, I think that what you have is a fantastic deal for all of the UK. There's no better outcome than the one um, I'm advocating tomorrow. This deal is pretty bad, and it's certainly worse than Theresa May's deal. When you're looking at issues like workers' rights or environmental rights or consumer rights, the government have massively watered down even some of the quite flaky commitments that Theresa May had made. Boris Johnson clearly wants to get some decision about his deal. We want to try and vote it down if we can. This is a bad deal, and it will mean loss of jobs, undermining of living standards, and problems for the long-term future. I'm not going to vote for something where in six or 12 months or two years' time, a constituent comes to me and says, I've lost my job. Where were you when you, I wanted you to protect me? Laura, hi. How are you? I'm fine, I'm fine. Very nice, nice to see you. you. Yeah. Hi. How are you? Um, OK. Cautious. Because? Um, it's on a knife edge, I think, tomorrow. Seven days ago, this seemed like even getting this far would be Im impossible. Yeah, I think that um, during the leadership election, I thought that uh, Boris, by uh, hitching himself to the October the 31st deadline, come what may, was making a mistake. But I've had to um, eat a um, um, fairly big slice of humble pie. Um, the truth is, he... Uh, I think has played things so far extraordinarily well. It, playing it extremely well means losing lots of votes, losing a case in the Supreme Court, having all sorts of sort of political agony. Of course things have gone wrong along the way. I mean, it must have felt pretty hairy at times, no? 
Well, the, the PM used a, an analogy in Cabinet a couple of weeks ago. He asked if any of us had ever done motocross. Uh, I never have. But he said that the, the whole point is it gets bumpier and bumpier, and the mud is flying everywhere. Just hold on to the handlebars and we'll get through. MPs are sitting on a Saturday for the first time in 37 years to vote on Boris Johnson's Brexit deal. Well, this morning, it still looks extremely close. Look at the chamber, it's now very full. And as we can see, uh, a huge crowd of MPs at... Uh, Hello, how are you? I'm very well, nice to see you too. Uh, we've just come from the big plenary of the European Research Group. We're going to vote for the agreement. Mm -hmm. So after all of this, you guys, whatever happens, you will just be solidly behind number 10? Yeah. Why? We've got to just... Well, the, the, the political gravity of the situation in the country today is far, far too bad. The withdrawal agreement has grave flaws, but we believe that this is, in the end, a tolerable path to get to a bright future. The same cannot be said of others. I'm afraid I need to race to the chamber. Okay. Cheers. Thanks, Steve. See you later on. Thanks, guys. Well, MPs are also likely to vote on an amendment to the deal, which would still force the government to seek a delay to leaving the EU, described as an insurance policy to avoid the risk of a no-deal Brexit. So, there's a thing called the Letwin Amendment. If the Letwin vote goes through, then he has to ask for the delay, whether or not he gets his deal through Parliament. Hello, it's Gitto. Um, you are what, definitely voting for the Letwin Amendment. And that's primarily to protect the, um, the, 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 to ensure that we don't crash out with a no deal accidentally. If they're still maintaining we are leaving on the 31st of October, we are exposed to crashing out. I mean, certainly my view is that we can't take the safeguards away. Um, so I will support this amendment. Yeah. The decision, you're going to abstain or not on the one? You're going to back the let one? OK, all right, thanks so much, Ray Tech. Bye. DP's backing let one. The eyes to the right, 322. The nose to the left, 306. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Wow, by quite a lot. MPs voted to force that extra bit of time, like an insurance policy, but that means Boris Johnson's got to do what he didn't want to do, which is write to the EU and say, uh, we might need a delay. In the order of the Prime Minister. Speaker, well, thank you. Further delay would be bad for this country, bad for, the, bad for our European Union, and bad for democracy. On the Halloween deadline, I think is now as real as the witches that will go and knock on the door on the night of Halloween and ask for sweets. I mean, it's gone. I back the Letwin Amendment because I still don't want to take the risk of leaving without a deal. So I suspect um, the Sunday papers will be not necessarily all that sort of pleasant for those of us who voted in a particular way. <sighs> da, da, da. My beer on there. Mm. I'll have that and a Mr. Kipling. If I go to my Facebook, it's I just pointed out there they aren't gonna let us leave and just said that I thought this was another stitch up. I uh, put it up a couple of hours ago just after the vote. 82 comments, of which the most recent ones are oh, thank you for continually trying hard to deliver what the electorate voted for. You must be so frustrated. That's an understatement. If I were Prime Minister, <laughs> I would bring the army in and arrest the traitors. I mean, there's another one just come in. Well, that one's a bit too rude. Not again. We look shambolic, incoherent, and dare I say it, ungovernable from a very sad voter. And I think that is probably the most accurate reflection of how people really feel. And that's Parliament's fault. I think it's um, extraordinarily irresponsible of um, some members of Parliament who simply disagree to accuse Parliament as a whole of somehow some sort of malfeasance or doing things wrong. 
Parliament, of course, is made of the elected representatives of the British people. Uh, the reason we're in this impasse is because people have different views, and that's the very nature of democracy. It's trying to resolve these complex questions. Here we are, it's the Brexit debate in a nutshell. The same things sound completely different to different ears. You know, there's no reasonable middle way in this debate anymore. It hasn't been for a long time, and with a more provocative Prime Minister, it's become even less so. The whole Brexit delay is holding us all back. I didn't want an election, but my friends, we have no choice. We're here because the Prime Minister doesn't trust Parliament and Parliament doesn't trust the Prime Minister. Boris Johnson hopes he'll get his way, but he might not. And if the Tories don't get a majority, then we might well be on the way to another referendum. So this will be a Brexit election. Today was supposed to be the day we left the European Union. Instead, the general election got underway in earnest. Labour will never, ever use our National Health Service as a bargaining chip in trade talks. They want the election to be about anything apart from Brexit. Sir, can you just shout, let's do this? OK, let's do this. Tories want the election to be about everything about Brexit. And that's the division. Let's get Brexit done, my friends, and get on with our project. You're kind of the odd couple, right? And a lot of the people we've met during the campaign are like, desperate about the choices in front of them. They don't tell the truth, do they? This is the trouble. Do you yeah. think any politician's telling you the truth this time? And it feels like everybody's sort of having to go through the motions because this was something that had to happen. It's like a necessary evil, right? With a bit of a dodgy choice. So are you going to be voting, do you think? Or? Oh, no, yeah. Don't know yet. Any, any issue putting you off this year? Do you want to play in? Yeah, yeah. Aren't you a fucking idiot? Until I grow up, maybe then. All right, well, remember I've been on your door, if nothing else. <laughs> All right, take care. Bye-bye. One of the biggest roles of the roulette ball in this election is the Tories' belief that they can pick up seats that by tradition, by instinct, by soul, are the Labour Party's territory. So these are quite clever, these cards we've got. If we think they're a Conservative, it's coloured like, it's a coloured dark blue like that. And if we think they're a probable Labour voter, it's coloured blue. So it's quite different to what we normally do. So just seeing if you'll be voting on Thursday. Yes. Thursday Will yeah. you be supporting Labour as well? I don't no. know where I'm going yet. OK. What, what's your reasoning that you're undecided? It's the state of everything that's going on with the Brexit and everything. I just don't know. Brexit, I think, you know, obviously it is an issue, without doubt. But I think what underlines that is it is basically people who feel like they've just not been listened to, especially working-class people. We will negotiate a credible leave deal with the European Union. <laughs> Let me finish, please. I've got to, I'm trying to answer the gentleman's question. Secondly, we will put that alongside Remain in a referendum. To be fair to Jeremy Corbyn, he was trying to do that balancing act. But when that happened, we'd get an influx of like 200 emails, you know, saying, you're not listening. We may or may not be living through a total reshaping of British politics where people are either leavers or remainers, they're not Labour voters or Tory voters. The last two elections have been massive surprises, and this one could be too. You know, nobody knows. Nobody knows. And this time it matters so much. I mean, certainly in my lifetime, and certainly in this job, there has never been a vote that's mattered in the same kind of way. It is five minutes to ten on polling day across the United Kingdom. For the fourth time in the space of five years, the future of the United Kingdom is uncertain. Nervous. This is the most nerve-wracking bit just before the exit poll comes out. We're hoping we can go to power ourselves. Of course we are. And we'll be disappointed if, if we don't. We're all feeling a bit sick, actually. It's really not about my job and whether I'm MP. It's about whether the United Kingdom is going to be 
going down the same road as Venezuela or whether we're going to be a market economy and leave the EU well. We are just seconds away from the result of the exit poll. Our first prediction of the potential outcome of this election. So, as Big Ben reaches 10 o'clock, we are standing by with those crucial exit poll figures. Here they are. Our exit poll is suggesting that there will be a Conservative majority when all the votes are counted after this election of December 2019. <laughs> but bloody hell, honestly, <laughs> don't shake my hands. We haven't counted it yet. We haven't got our count yet. If these numbers are broadly correct, Boris Johnson may just have redrawn the map. A momentous junction for our country. I still can't believe it's that bad for Labour. I didn't get the feel of that from the campaign, and I don't think anyone else did. If it is, it's pretty crushing. I'm extremely disappointed. My big fear is that it then hands over government to possibly the most right-wing candidate, extreme right-wing cabinet we've ever seen in political history in this country. So I fear for the future if this is right. Just our own sampling. There were everything that was being predicted before. Look, we're losing badly. Yeah. It's not been easy at all. It's probably one of the most difficult elections that I've ever experienced. But we've run a really positive campaign. So, you know, I'm hopeful. James Nelson Grundy, the Conservative Party candidate. 21,266 votes. <laughs> Joanne Marie Platt, Labour and Cooperative Party, 19,000. Yeah! The Tories have been in power for nearly a decade, and a lot of people have really seen the fabric of their lives change for the worse because of political decisions that were taken. And by the normal pendulum swing of British politics, that means that the Tories should be out. Oh, Gina, come here. You're so... Not I know, fault I know. Is all that yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Life isn't great here. You know, people don't feel that, that Labour represent them. Brexit has just put it on steroids, what's happening in towns like this. Yay! The argument that number 10 was prepared for from the summer was look at this terrible parliament and they've held it up and made a mess and we're the ones who can end the agony. And that's exactly the story that they told at the election. And it really worked. But it wasn't just about Brexit. It was also about Jeremy Corbyn, who is the least popular leader of the opposition there has ever been. This is obviously a very disappointing night for the Labour Party. I want to make it clear that I will not lead the party in any future general election campaign. It is 6.13 in the morning. If you've not been watching overnight, you've missed quite a few earth-shattering results. Traditional, rich, strong Labour territory switching into Conservative hands. The Conservatives have won the general election with a hefty majority of 80 seats. For three and a half years, everyone has been wriggling on the same hook. Is Brexit going to happen or not? And after the last 24 hours, that question mark has been removed. Let's get Brexit done. But first, my friends, let's get breakfast done. <laughs> Someone texted me this morning saying Boris was always either going to be the Prime Minister for 10 weeks or for 10 years. And with a majority of this size, Brexit might just be the start.